I'm Estelle Bingham, and this is the Love Purpose Connection podcast. Here on Love Purpose Connection, I want to explore how to discover and really develop the secrets of a good life. I'm a holistic therapist and healer, and so over this series, I'll be sharing frank, inspiring, sometimes raw, often joyful conversations with a different guest each time, exploring just what those three words really mean, and also, crucially, how you can discover and develop them in your own life. Today, I'm talking with renowned psychotherapist and author of The Wild Edge of Sorrow, Francis Weller. His work on grief and shame has profoundly inspired my own work. For the last 30 years, Francis has been examining the multiple ways grief moves through all of our lives. The truth is, we often avoid it at all costs. Grief can often imprison us, but by the end of this conversation, you'll have a completely new understanding of why embracing this very human emotion can actually really open the heart and bring us back to life in a truly liberated way. Francis Weller, welcome to the Love Purpose Connection podcast. It's a real pleasure to be with you. I've been sitting with your book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, for some time, and Chapter one, he writes, I'm not sure how or when I began my apprenticeship with sorrow. I do know that it was my gateway back into the breathing and animate world. It was through the dark waters of grief that I came to touch my unlived life by at last unleashing tears I had never shed for the losses in my world. Grief led me back into a world that was vivid and radiant. There is some strange intimacy between grief and aliveness some sacred exchange between what seems unbearable and what is most exquisitely alive. Through this, I have come to have a lasting faith in grief. And that piece of writing we keep coming back to, and with this book, which I have to say has been on my bedside table, and I've gone back to it and reread and reread because it takes time to just absorb the beauty of the words and also the sacred power of the work. I'm interested in how it began for you. It has many kind of ancillary tributaries that came together. First of them, just the very personal ones of a lot of early losses in my life that uh, marked my soul, I think. And then as I spend time as a psychotherapist for the last almost 40 years, you really begin to sense that what, what's sitting in front of you is the untouched sorrows of a lifetime. And people come in and say, you know, I've, I'm feeling depressed. And you realize quickly that it's not, op- it's not depression, it's oppression. That there's this weight of untouched and unacknowledged grief and sorrow in a person's life in part because we don't had a, a language for that sorrow in our culture, in white Western culture in particular. And then I was introduced to uh, ritual work in the mid-90s, and I began to see the relationship between community and ritual and grief work and realizing how threadbare we have become around providing what the soul actually requires to digest and metabolize grief into something beyond just an endurance package, but into something much more vital and necessary for our own ripening. So there's been multiple threads and multiple layers of experience that have kind of brought me to this place now of seeing what it is that we need to be able to become skillful at. I also then, I guess I realized that grief was much more than just an emotion. It was actually a core human faculty and that we were, for the most part, uneducated in this faculty. So when grief arrives at our door, we don't know how to respond. And so we tend to try to find ways to keep it locked out and banished from the immediacy of our own, uh, our own experience, much to our loss and much to the loss of the community. Um, because that is, that is the process that really does, I think, the deepest work of ripening us into mature human beings is, is, the, is the ability to, to uh, encounter loss and sorrow. So there's, there's so much there already, Francis. And, and just to, to go back to this idea of the oppression 
because also in my work when clients come to see me often there's you know underlying or low-lying depression the anxiety and when we start to really tap into these sorrows or all this all the trauma that the the trauma that's been stuffed away um it really is an oppression on the soul and the way that that I go back in is 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 through the heart and the way that it feels like you go back in is through grief but it's really one of the same thing this idea of love and and grief and we can come back to that but this idea of oppression and that that maybe if we don't meet these sorrows that we hold so deeply within us that we don't get a chance to touch the soul in the incarnation i think that's absolutely true uh we end up becoming strategic about our lives, but not engaging our lives. What we want is to have the full range of vitality uh, accessible to us. And when we marginalize grief uh, through fear, through shame, through uh, just a, a lack of trust and faith in the process, we collapse our entire emotional terrain and we live in what I call a flatline culture, where there's a very narrow range of what it is that we're allowed to feel. And so when you collapse the lower register of, of grief, you also collapse the upper register of joy. And so we live in a very narrow band of life, which I think is what depression really is. It's, it's that marginalized or compressed experience of what it is I'm actually allowed to touch and to feel and to engage. The soul came here for full engagement. And I think one of our lingering sorrows is this, is this uh, fragmented experience of what it is we're allowed to encounter. We feel all alone and in a sense, shuddered into our own interiorities where we have to manage our experiences and not expose them for, for fear of further marginalization. It's interesting, this idea of this sort of gray life. And when I speak to my clients, I talk to them about the palette of the full palette of, you know, experience that goes from the, the, the darkness and it goes all the way through every subtle shade to, to the brightness, like you talk about the joy and, and the, it goes from the, the purples to the blues to the yellows and and it life is about this full spectrum of color and that's when we're alive and one of the things that really comes up in a big way and you you mentioned this is this idea of shame and shame features heavily in your book you talk a lot about shame and how that really holds us prisoner can you tell tell us a little bit more about that well shame begins to kind of uh, gather on any part of our experience that is not reflected back to us. So if I go into my home with heartache and grief and no one in the household acknowledges it, what begins to gather around that experience is that this is not okay. This is not right. There's something you know fundamentally flawed about the experience. And so um, we begin to feel ashamed of those territories. And then they have to take on a certain hidden quality to them where we refuse to show any vulnerability to, to the world for fear of further shame or criticism or ridicule. And if you think about uh, what I call the, the second gate of grief, which is the parts of us that have not known love, uh, our weakness, our neediness, our feelings of inadequacy, our sadness, sometimes even our sensuality, our exuberance, all of these things can begin to carry a feeling of not being welcomed. And so they begin to be marginalized. They begin to become what I call outcasts. And they're no longer accessible to my experience of being a human being. And wherever there is that sense of loss to my integrity, to my wholeness, that's a place of grief. But I can't grieve for these parts of me because I've learned to hold them now with, with judgment, with contempt, as if they're shameful. So part of the deep work of grieving, I think, at least in my own practice here with people, is how do we begin the process of 
redeeming the outcasts, so bringing them back into where it's warm. There's an old alchemical thought that you, have, in order for something to move or to change, the material must be kept warm. Well, shame is a very cold place. Contempt is a very cold place. Judgment is cold. So there's no warmth there. So these parts of us that have been exiled cannot heal, cannot mend until that atmosphere begins to warm through compassion, through kindness, through mercy, through engagement, through intimacy, through affection. That's when it can begin to warm the territory. And that's when the tears begin to fall because the materials begin to thaw. And what was frozen in trauma or in shame or in banishment, they begin to move again. And we're freed up to share who we are. So that's the sort of re-entry into life, that kind of touching back into a, a vitality that you, you talk about of being alive. Yeah, we, we think we can somehow muscle our way through life only showing certain facets of our identity, my strength, my competence. But really what we're missing are the more, are the more tender parts of us that allow and, and make capable love, purpose, and connection. Those, those come through not so much our strength, but our, but our tenderness, our vulnerability. And if we're not allowed to carry those, because we live in a very heroic culture where we only show strength and, and competence, then we don't have that way of coming more into the relational, communal part of our life. And that's where a lot of our grief lives, I think. So... Tell me a little bit about the gates of grief for people who haven't heard about the five gates of grief. They became more and more apparent as I sat with communities doing grief work. And, um, you know, they grew. Initially, there was, you know, the first gate of grief, which was what we're all familiar with, which is that when we would lose something or someone that we love, whether it's a, a parent or a child or a friendship or a marriage, Something that we love dies, leaves, disappears. And that's the only gate that um, culturally we acknowledge to one another. The other four gates rarely are ever openly acknowledged. And the second gate I mentioned is, is um, the parts of us that have never known love. And this is the, the, really the heart of the work that probably you do and that I do in, in my practice is... Uh, is sitting with the parts of us that have been shamed and banished and traumatized into exile. The third gate are the sorrows of the world. Uh, and as I sat with groups of people doing grief rituals, this grief became more and more prevalent in the room. People are coming to, to the grief rituals, not so much for their own personal losses, but for the sorrows of the world whether that's species depletions or the ravages of climate catastrophe, the disappearance of polar ice caps. Uh, this is in our bodies. This grief is so intimately in our bodies because our bodies cannot be separated, segregated from the living tissue of the world. We have a fantasy that we're separate because we live in cities and we drive in cars and we have air conditioning and, and we can go to the grocery store. But our air, our water... Our very lives are utterly entangled with everything that's around us. And so this grief is becoming more and more prominent in our bodies and our lives. The fourth gate was a little more difficult to, to name, but it, what, I, what I call it is uh, what we expected and did not receive. And what I mean by that is that we were wired, we, we arrived here wired for the entire human encounter. We were wired, we came here with our deep time ancestral expectations fully intact. We expected to have 40 pairs of eyes looking at us in the morning, wondering what we dreamt. We'd be gathering food together. We'd be sharing stories and songs at night. We'd be doing rituals together to either give thanks or to go through initiations or to grieve together. We expected to be out under the stars, listening to the old stories told by the elders, and almost none of that materialized. And in its place is this great silence, this profound emptiness that we typically blame ourselves for. Like, what did I do wrong to feel so empty inside? But what if that emptiness is actually a profound absence? 
where what it is that we anticipated when we arrived here just did not materialize. And the fifth gate of grief is what I call ancestral grief. And the more I sit with people in my practice and the more I sit with them in ritual space, the more I see this one becoming more and more prominent, that much of the grief that we're carrying began generations ago, perhaps centuries ago, when we lost touch with village, when we lost touch with the uh, sacramental quality of the cosmos, when the world became a clockwork, when we became more and more uh, conditioned by individualism. The grief that we carry from our ancestral lives is really quite profound, I think. And here in America, we have the additional ancestral grief of what happened to the indigenous populations when, we, when white Westerners arrived here. We have the importation of slavery 400 years ago. Uh, we have what we did to the ecosystems that were decimated um, by carelessness and usury. So the ancestral grief is really a thick territory that we're just beginning to unpack, but feels vital that we, that we really spend time here and, uh, and weep openly into the grief of our ancestors. We hold, like you say, this immense amount of unexpressed sorrow and going back to the land and, and you know, this, this, this return to the indigenous soul, our connectedness, the earth, our relationship to the earth feels like it's so important to, 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 to happen. It needs to happen now. If I have hope, that's where it lies, which is, is in heartbreak. When I first began leading grief rituals and talking about it and writing about it, there was not a lot of uh, interest. But as the years have gone by and our denial has begun to crack, about the severity of our situation. It may be the broken heart that saves our lives, that saves what remains. It may be the heart that's broken open because what, what, what it's saying, what this grief is saying is that there is actually a tremendous intimacy between this singular body of me or you and the wider body of the planet. And if the heart can break open to that, we have a chance of being the receptor sites to respond to the suffering of the world. I don't think we're going to do anything out of moralism, out of obligation. I think it will turn totally on affection. And so the grief that we feel for the world becomes the thing that calls us into, into action, what I call soul activism. So when the heart is breaking, that's when we're most prone to respond. We will respond when we feel the sorrow, the, the suffering, the pain, the grief. It's the idea of our breakdowns becoming our breakthroughs, facilitating a deeper connection with self and, and then with the world. And isn't that what we need right now? We need people who are responding to the world, to what is happening. Um, we need people who are willing to show up and be in the streets and be you know, wherever the need is to protect, to care for, to preserve the fragile systems that, that we all depend upon. And that, that really requires a heart that's been broken open. So when you were young, Francis, did you have this feeling about nature? I would have to say no. I was raised in a very small town in the Midwest, in Wisconsin. And I think I was conditioned to think that what was best, what was superior, were the cities. All of my uncles were farmers. And so I would go out to the farms quite regularly. And there would be tre tremendous beauty out there. But there'd also be the sense of domestication, control. We could subdue nature, you know, and it was probably in my 20s and 30s where that fiction began to crumble. I spent much more time in nature as I grew up, as I got older and live, and I live now in the woods, and I can't imagine living in a city right now. I just, 
my heart feels so much at home with with the you know the the sorrel and the ferns and the and the uh, dog firs and the redwoods. That's where I breathe deepest now. So I didn't come by it easily or early. It, it has come later and great and with great gratitude. So that companioning of of yourself feels like it was moving alongside your deepening into nature. Yeah, I think the wounds that I carried were wounds of shame. So there's a way in which I felt isolated and disconnected from everything. I think part of what shame does what and what, what our personalized psychology does is it makes us feel different and exceptional in the ways that we suffer. So I felt no one could understand my wound. No one could understand me. So I had to kind of keep myself partitioned and, and segregated off. But as I, as, as I say, as I worked with that, and I began to give talks about shame, and hundreds and hundreds of people came to these talks, and my fiction, my fantasy of being different was absolutely that. It was a fantasy. And as I began to feel my commonality between my suffering and others, that's when all those other gates began to pour in and I could begin to feel the sorrows of the world. I could begin to see and feel into the sorrows of the ancestral lines. And they all began to kind of coalesce into a mutually engaged, entwined net of grief and beauty at the same time. I'm interested too in what you do with your tears, you know, what you do when you feel overwhelmed by the the attack on the earth. What do you do with that grief? Well, 22 years ago, I uh, started a project to create a village out of what I had learned over the years. And I told these people that I was going to teach that um, I I will teach you what I've learned. But at the end of it, I'm going to leave, and three months later, you're going to welcome me in as a member because I'm doing this out of pure selfishness. I need a village. I need a place that can hold me to go through all of what life will inevitably put at my feet, losses and divorces and, you know, endings and failures and tragedies. So 22 years ago, I did that and began that, and we have been, been together ever since then. We meet several times a month. And we do ritual together and we share tears together. We share gratitude and celebration together. We've had children born. We've had parents die. We don't all live together, but our soul lives are all entangled. And I know that that's a place that will hold me no matter what comes. And the level of earth grief right now is very daunting. And so I have circles of friends and my village, and we share this regularly because we cannot hold it alone. The heart that's overwhelmed by this grief will, by necessity, have to shut down. But I also have certain friends out in the forest, trees that I've become very, you know, very intimate with, that I go and sit with and talk to, and um, places where I can let the tears fall to the dirt, to the to the earth, and and feel held. So we need regular visitations to the ground to be able to empty our cup, to share ritual space together, to be with friends, to acknowledge the sorrows. We cannot do this alone. I'd like to talk a little bit about that, the idea of you going into the forest and that you found friends in the trees. You've got certain trees that that hold the space for you. Well, a couple months ago, I was going to bed filled with dread and heaviness and probably just saturated with sorrow. And some part of me turned around and I walked over to my bookshelf and I pulled off a collection of essays by Linda Hogan, who's a Chickasaw writer, And the book was called Dwellings. And I opened the book to the chapter called All My Relations. 
And I realized in that moment how much my dread and my and the heaviness and the fear had caused a contraction in my heart and in my soul. And so I was feeling cut off from all those relationships. I forgot that they're always there. And so in my imagination, I began to extend the tendrils outward again to those trees that I love and to the Russian river that's below my house that I spend as much time at as I can and to the sky and to the moon, to my friends, to the ravens, you know, and began to feel back into the living tissue that I'm always entangled with, but that I forget. I mean, human beings have the great capacity for amnesia and for anesthesia. And so when I go into that amnesia, when I forget that entanglement, I'm, I'm basically all alone again. And so when I can remember that and then nourish that, I bring gifts to these trees. This one tree in particular I call the Buddha tree that spoke to me very, very powerfully many years ago. I bring gifts and sit inside of it and uh, feel utterly, utterly at home in the body of this great old redwood. And I begin to let myself feel the porousness between my body and its body. And we breathe together. This is not an other that I'm looking at and observing. This is a friend. This is part of my family. So beautiful, Francis. I really hope that inspires people to deepen into their relationship with the trees and with nature and everything that's around us. Well, those relationships require repetition. You know, just like any friendship, you don't develop a friendship by seeing somebody once. It requires going back again and again and again and again and again. That's the faithfulness. That's the fidelity. That's the feeding of the third body, which is the the soul of the connection between you and the other. And when we feed that, when we nourish that, something emerges, something takes shape. And it's in that exchange. It's the it's what's between the two of us that's most alive. It's not what's inside of me or what's inside of the tree or a friend. It's what's between us that you want to feed. Feed the love between you and the other, and that thing will grow. So what do you say to people when they first experience grief, when they first experience the loss of a loved one? that almost like moving into that first gate of grief, but where there is sort of utter despair. And it's interesting because I lost my father almost over a year ago. And then four months later, I lost my cousin who who died of cancer very quickly. And it's interesting the different layers of grief because my father was a certain age and there was a, a, a kind of a, a, an acceptance that he was in his 80s. And then my cousin being in his early 50s, there was this absolute shock. And I work with other people's grief all the time. And the subtlety of, of losing a loved one for different people, it's a different experience. But it's the shock, I think, that is a, like a tsunami initially. Yeah, and just being able to honor the rhythms of that grief. Sometimes you want to be utterly alone, and sometimes you can't tolerate the feeling of being alone. And being able to learn how to become a companion to that sorrow. That it isn't about trying to get over it, but learn how to be in a steady and abiding relationship with it. Again, we are, we, we are terrified of grief because we, are not, we have not been educated in grief. So what I try to do with people is slowly build a bridge between them and the sorrow that's there. I mean, you can't get away from it. It's right there. But we tend to try to build barricades to it. And so there's not, I don't say a lot of words in terms of comforting because it's not so much comfort that they need as much as they need a sense of how do I stay here? How do I not just collapse under the weight of this. And sometimes I say, well, sometimes you have to be drawn to the ground. You know, trust 
trust that this grief knows where it's trying to take you. It has its own intelligence, its own wisdom. And if you can come into a a slowly ripened relationship with sorrow, you will come through that space radically changed. You know, I'm sure your, your own encounter with your father's death has changed you. I often imagine it as, it's, as if another layer of depth in the basement of my own being has been excavated and I can hold more now. Not that I'm you know, better, but that I have the greater capacity to stay present when those fierce winds blow. Yeah, there's something imperative about meeting yourself and and allowing yourself in a very loving way, like you say, with that compassion. But that requires a feeling of being at least marginally tethered to others. You know, I, I don't, grief has always been communal in our long story as a species. And only very recently have we been kind of required to face it solitarily. And I don't think we can. So I think that's part of what I encourage the people I sit with is make sure that you have as an access someone who can sit with you, maybe even in silence, maybe just holding that space with you. You don't have to entertain them. You don't have to do anything for them to know that there's a tether, that you're not just in free fall. Did you find that sort of over the past year with with COVID and more people dying and and sort of more confronting, challenging energy just day to day where people are spending more time having to think about who they are and and how they feel about themselves and the world. Did you find that that the grief work became a lot more popular? Did you notice a sort of change? Well, the setting for engaging it was radically different. I mean, the, the grief rituals are incredibly intimate and vulnerable and physical. We're, we're, we, we're weeping side by side, you know, with lots of bodily fluids and we're singing together and, you know, we're doing all the things that we cannot do right now. So the, the need for the grief rituals are, has never been greater uh, with the isolation and the deaths and the, the terror and the disruption of the ordinary, you know, going to work or to sitting at a restaurant with a friend or you know, being in a park. All these things have been dis- disrupted. So the need for the grief rituals has never been greater, but how we conduct them now is very, very different. And um, it's hard. I must just confess, I think it's really hard to do grief work online in part because the container is so important for the ability to release grief. You have to feel utterly held in order to put to set grief down. And online, I just, I just can't encourage that level of vulnerability. So people touch it and there's tears, but there's not the same sense of being able to fall to your knees with the gravity of sorrow pulling you down to the ground. That requires a very strong holding space uh, where you can feel like I can surrender to that gravity and not try to hold myself up. This idea of bringing the journey back to the indigenous soul and the the importance of of this indigenous soul. So for people who don't know and understand what that means, I just wanted to um, explain a little bit about that. And also just where you touched into this indigenous energy. I think you mentioned that there was a, a shaman that you work with, companioned you on this journey. Well, I mentioned Maladoma um, Somme, and he was very, very important in the kind of the quickening of my understanding of ritual and community. But I don't want to make indigenous sound too exotic. I, I want to make it sound like that's that's something that is in, innate in each of us. If we go back far enough on our own lineages, we all come from some place that was indigenous, that was rooted to place and had its own traditions, its own rituals, its own myths, its own food, its own intimacy with landscape. Uh, For many of us, that's been disrupted. 
And so we oftentimes look towards indigenous cultures like from Africa or Native American or, or whatever, South American, and we try to emulate that. And I don't think that's going to work because I think what, we are, what we're required to do, uh, the idea of becoming indigenous ourselves comes from a Native American teacher here by the name of Jeanette Armstrong, an Okanagan elder in British Columbia. She said it's, it's, it's crucial that we each become, that every one of us become indigenous. And so what does that mean? It means that we cultivate a, a lasting and prolonged fidelity to place, that we come to know the migratory patterns. I know when the crickets are going to sing in the summertime. I know when the blackberries are going to be ripe. I know this place now. I've become intimate with it. So to become indigenous requires a prolonged faithfulness to a place, and then to cultivate a, 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 a quality of relationship to the others who share this place. We cannot simply import rituals from other cultures. That's not the context out of which my psyche was shaped. It's so important that we begin to show up here and, again, put our flag on the ground to become indigenous here so that we can live in right relationship to all of the watersheds and the bioregions and the whole continent. So tell me a little bit about your work with cancer patients, Francis. Well, several times a year, I have the honor to sit with a group of people from around the country, sometimes from around the world, who are undertaking a very difficult journey with cancer. And sitting with them, I began to see how parallel their, their process was to a genuine initiation. So I began to frame it as a rough initiation. Well, let me just say that frequently in these, in these week-long retreats, it's rare that we talk about cancer. What we end up talking about primarily is the unlived life, that their cancer has brought to the foreground all the parts of their lives that have been abandoned and neglected. And most of us are not given the uh, impetus to begin to call back to us what has been forgotten. And they have been given this strange grace to face the life that hasn't been lived and to, in a sense, encounter what I call practicing immensity to become immense, to get our arms not only around hope and love and, you know, faith, but also around death and fear and grief. You have to have arms big enough to put yourself around all of that. I remember one young woman I was in a session with, and she had just been married, just gotten married. She was young, young, in early 30s and full of that expectation of possibly having children and and then she got this terrible diagnosis, a very, a very deadly cancer. And she sat with me and she said, I'm just terrified. I am so terrified. And I just sat with her in her terror. And then I asked her, can you recall a moment in your lifetime in which you encountered something you might call the sacred? And she thought for a while and she said, yes. She said, I remember being in a sweat lodge once a long time ago. And it was one of those lodges that had an opening in the ceiling. And I could see the, the stars through that opening. She said, I, I felt a profound connection to the ancestors in that moment. And I said, okay. Now, was that woman sitting there feeling that connection to the ancestors bigger than the terror you're feeling right now? And she said, absolutely. I said, well, that's how big you have to be right now. You have to be able to hold that frightened sister of yours. So my work with the cancer community has been profoundly inspiring to me around being able to find the courage to live large. As they say in South Africa, you know, when death finds you, make sure it finds you alive. I want death to find me alive. I need to ask you what those words, love, purpose, connection, mean to you. Well, that really speaks to the entanglement that we talked about all you know, throughout our conversation, that love is the sister of grief, 
purpose is, you know, what do we do with what, what we've been allowed to digest in our lifetime? You know, I often say to the cancer community participants, I give them these 10 practices um, and they can do them in any order they want. But number one is self-compassion. And number 10 is service. That what you've gathered in your journey of cancer was never meant for you alone. That at some point it must become a great giveaway. Something that you bestow like seed on those that you encounter. That's a deep purpose. And connection, how can we possibly get away from it? Our lives are so entangled, wildly engaged with one another. It's only the fantasy of the fiction of individualism and our conditioned isolation and that causes us to forget that truth. So to come back into it, alleluia. It is a blessing. Before I go, did you get my email about reading a poem? There's many that I, that I carry. I'm trying to think into the right one. Well, now another one wants to come in. Finally, this is a poem by Pesha Gertler called uh, The Healing Time. It speaks to some of the shame and some of the outcast parts of us. It's, she says, finally, on my way to yes, I bumped into all the places where I said no to my life. All the untended wounds, the red and purple scars, those hieroglyphs of pain carved into my skin and bone the old misdirections that send me down the wrong street again and again. Where I find them, the old wounds and the old misdirections, and I lift them up one by one, close to my heart, and I say, holy, holy. Well, that just sums it up, doesn't it, Francis? Grief, the holy visitor. Yes. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, Estelle. Beautiful questions. I hope we touch the depth of something that will offer something of sustenance to your community. To find out more about Francis, you can go to www.franciswellert.net. You can find me at estelle.bingham. I hope these conversations are bringing you some joy and healing at this time. And of course, if you've enjoyed the show, do rate and review it. This podcast is produced by Sarah Cudden with Exec Production from Kate Taylor. It's a Feast Collective production. Until the next one, wishing you all more love, purpose and connection. Thank you.